I have to download the app in order to participate today. You can just go through the entire thing. Yeah. All right. Ready? choice and on your screen it will give you between two and four options. Okay. So the first question, cognitive interaction believes that an ideal linguistic environment consists of deep formal instruction and grammar and vocabulary, interaction input output noticing and acculturation, a mix of translation of target language and speaking practice, or expo exposing the learner exclusively to the target language. Yeah, so cognitive, in, um, cognitive interactionists <coughs> believe that there are five factors that interact to support complete language acquisition. Task-based language instruction to complete the phrase is a sentence. Um, focus focuses on using language to communicate meaning and you can pick more than one. Focus is mostly on learning, practicing grammatical forms, seeks to emulate authentic language use, or suggests teacher-centered instruction is best. Okay. So the correct answers were the red and the yellow. Games create opportunities to practice which of these language skills. You may select more than one. So speaking, reading, writing, or listening. Yeah, all of those things. In the context of task-based language teaching, a task must select more than one to engage learners' interests have a primary focus on meaning, have a clear outcome or goal for learners to achieve, or relate to real world activities. So all of them. Okay. Students work in pairs to complete a closed grammar activity in which they conjugate verbs. Is this a task or not a task? So in a more traditional way, as teachers, I think we think of a task like anything the student completes. Yeah, but in this way of talking about language instruction, um, this would not count because it doesn't meet all the requirements. Anyone want to take a shot? What requirements would this not meet if they're just conjugating verbs? Interaction with each other. Yeah. So that, that's one of them. It's not really interaction. Um, it's not real life based. It's not authentic. Yeah. yeah. Because in real life, once they're outside of the language class, they're not going to be sitting down in pairs conjugating verbs. Right? We don't, we just don't do that in life unless we're learning how to conjugate verbs. So that's the big reason. It's not really meaningful or authentic. Students collect personal information on birthdays to make a class birthday calendar. So is that a task or is that not a task? So this does qualify as a task. And this starts to become kind of an opinion thing sometimes too, the task or not. I would say in jobs that where I've worked, people really do go and collect people's birthday information when they start, and they put it on a calendar so that you can get a little birthday note, maybe a sliced cake or something. Yeah. And it's always good to do that in class too, or in class work. Yeah. I would say 
it up now. Students work together writing captions or pictures or posting a collaborative class blog. So they're practicing like present continuous or maybe past tense. traditional kind of foreign language instruction approach. So it does not count as a test. It is free and out of dialogue. So not really. Can you think of a situation where it would be a test? I can think of one. It could be a Yeah, so that's getting closer to being a task, yeah, if, you, if it's more free practice, yeah. And then part of it, the context of the dialogue, too. Interview maybe? Yeah. Like yes. A, a, a role play uh -huh. of a restaurant or a job interview or... Yeah. Exactly, if it's like an authentic role play, mm. where it's free and like they're producing the language. Great. And then I was also thinking, maybe if they're studying to be actors, right, mm -hmm. so they're learning English for the purpose of being an actor, then that could be authentic for that population. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind about authenticity. It's relative, it's relative to your audience. Um, Pre-teaching the future form, going to plus verb, then having learners personalize the information. Right, so for example, you have them practice talking about what they're gonna do this weekend. Kind of, kind of right? <laughs> Sounds dicey. Yeah. So Jane Willis, um, one of the foremost experts in like task-based language teaching, her opinion is that this would not qualify as a task um, because it's not really like a real life thing you're doing with language. Um, but I don't agree with her because we use language for social purposes but in a presentation that she made, she marked this as not a task. Okay. And so this is kind of what I was saying, and I think this is where the confusion comes when we talk, to, talk about task-based language teaching, is that we perceive what would qualify as a task as a different thing, too, like among teachers. In addition to just the traditional way of thinking about the concept of the, a task, like the definition of the word. But we're almost done with this. Role play activities in which learners are not playing themselves. So if they're behaving like a different person who they will never be, right? Like let's say you're making one of them pretend they're a pilot and they don't plan on becoming pilots. Okay, so that's not a task because it's, like this is again from Willis, from, from Jane Willis. She argues it's not a task um, because they're not themselves, which makes it inauthentic. Right? And there's no future self in which they are going to be this person. Okay. But it gives them perspective. It's an appearance. It could. Yeah. Yeah. Authentically yeah. into a different point of view. And in, in a role play of, say, a job interviewee and a job interviewer, somebody has to play the boss man in the suit with the tie. Right. And a lot of those students are not going to be boss man. Yeah. But some might be, but certainly that part is still necessary in a role play. For sure. Yeah. yeah so again, this is why at least abroad, people are very confused about what task-based language teaching is. Because it is confusing and it becomes subjective. Um, so again, I don't completely agree with Jane Willis on this one either. I think it depends. Because you have to create someone to, for them to interact with, right, in the classroom. So maybe it's only authentic for one speaker at the moment. Um, but yeah, in order to do that kind of activity, someone needs to take on the role. So the last one, Plan a cooperative board game in which learners must stop the spread of the disease. Is that a task or not a task? Yes, it's a task. All right. So, congratulations, Mary, task teacher. <laughs> you are the golden children from Smith. All right. So.
let's, let's get into the actual presentation now. You know, when I was in Peace Corps, I remember when they were giving us training, but this was also a really confusing thing for the, the volunteers to do. Okay. Like, is it a task or not? So the objectives for today, we're going to identify what a task is in the context of task-based language teaching, which again is always up for debate. Every time I've been a participant or presented on this, there's always disagreement, so that's okay. Because um, task-based language teaching is theoretical, right? It's, it's, all, it's, not, it's something we're experimenting with right now. Um, so the next objective will be we'll, we'll talk about how board games fulfill the definition of a task. And finally, we're going to apply a framework um, to convert, hopefully, any video game or any um, board game that you play just for fun into a meaningful language task. So task-based language teaching is based on um, theory in which, over time, a group of uh, academics who have called themselves the cognitive interactionists have identified these five items that are necessary in their, in their theory to completely acquire a second language. So this is for complete acquisition. Um, so they're comprehensible input. Does anyone know what comprehensible input is? Can you give an example? Well, it's just something that the learners would understand is comprehensible. So their instructions or something is comprehensible. Yeah. So how can you make instructions for a board game more comprehensible for students? scaffolding language yeah, to, to present it. So using a picture to help them understand, or a video of people playing the game. Um, and then how about comprehensible or pushed output? Anyone familiar with that idea? Okay, so pushed output is the result of you needing to communicate something and using the language resources you have available to create a message. So pushed output is like that situation where you're in a foreign country and you're trying to purchase an item and you say it all awkward because you don't know how, um, but you communicate the message, right? The message is received, the person understands, even if the language isn't target language, it's not like the grammar. So we see this a lot with our learners um, that we don't understand what they're saying. We say, can you repeat, can you rephrase that? And eventually, they produce something that's comprehensible, but not grammatical, probably. Um, so that's um, what we're talking about here, the pushed output. Interaction, that's exactly what it sounds like. And then the benefit of interaction is that if you think about when students are communicating with one another, they have a hard time understanding each other sometimes. So interaction creates comprehensible input and creates pushed output. Right? Because the learners, to help each other understand, they have to make each other comprehensible. So they'll draw a picture, or they'll use their cell phone to show an image. Um, and then they're also creating language. So interaction is kind of where input and output meet. Noticing is just when learners become aware of um, a lack that they have in their language ability. So maybe they're mispronouncing something, maybe there's a vocabulary word they don't know. Maybe there's a structure that they're not familiar with skipping over because they don't know it yet. So noticing is that moment where the learner becomes aware that there's something that they don't know or that there's something that they're doing that's not target, that's not correct grammar. And finally, acculturation. Anyone want to take a guess as to what they're referring to here? Yeah, so that's part of it, yeah. So the board games create that, but in, in, the, in the framework of the cognitive interactionist, anyone? I would move that more towards the comprehensible input. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes repeating a message can help, can help make it more comprehensible. No, but when you're, when you're speaking, when you get used to putting certain words together as an output, is what I would think of. Yeah. Well, they, they learn how to play a game. I mean, they're learning a script, something along that line. Yeah, exactly. 
So they're learning how to play a game. They're identifying with the cultural practice. And if it's successful, they're feeling more like they're part of the culture. So acculturation is more about a feeling of belonging in the target language culture. Yeah. And some of these board games are specific to particular cultures. And so they, if I think of uh, Monopoly, for example, mm -hmm. that game has a lot of cultural factors to it that maybe is not the same in other cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's, so, that's a great example too of how board games can meet acculturation. Um, like, in that sense, where they're modeling culture and they're teaching culture through the game. So, like over there, we have a Washington version of Monopoly. So, these five things interact to create complete language acquisition. That's the theory. So, that's the sum of the theory. The interaction of these five factors. So, task based language teaching is where we have a task that is meaningful and authentic or semi-authentic. So somehow there's a clear connection between the language used um, for completing the task and <coughs> real life language use. Um, so I would say board games, a lot of the language produced, like what, what kind of language do you think they're producing? Is it more like academic? Or do you think maybe it's more like social language? Or maybe more just like requests, what would you imagine happening in a board game in terms of the languages that we need to play the game? Social, but sometimes academic, depending on the game. Yeah. So you'll get a mix. Yeah. It, it all depends on the game and um, your student's level in terms of like what language they're going to produce and what language you're going to need to fill the gaps in for. Um, and so I, I picked this chart because in Nicaragua, and I assume that the, the problem happens here sometimes too, is that teachers will try to go from a more teacher-centered approach um, to suddenly having students do a task. And part of being able to do task-based language teaching is you have to have a classroom culture in which the learners are used to it and they expect it, and they're used to being in control of classroom activity. Yeah, if you try to go from a teacher-centered approach and you just throw a board game on them, you're probably going to shock them and you're, you might have a bad experience. Um, and I remember seeing this a lot in Nicaragua. And for my, me, me making the mistake, me going into a teacher-centered approach teaching and going, we're going to do tasks. Okay? Everyone get in groups and you're going to make a poster about your favorite musician coming to do a concert or something. And then they would do one. So it's something you have to build up to. That's what I'm getting at. Like you have to create a classroom where the students feel empowered and like confident to do this. Um, anyone want to throw out a few ideas for how do we how do we create that classroom environment? Oh, I just wanted to make a comment yeah. about that. That I had one situation with a, in a with in a classroom. Um, um, as an administrator, I received a student that was upset because the teacher was doing a lot of activities in the classroom. And, and, and she thought that, that was not, she was not wearing anything. That the, the teacher is supposed to be in front of the classroom, uh, teaching formally lessons, and um, that they are not learning anything from those activities. And then, you know, I had to uh, have a conversation with, with the lady, you know, for, for quite a long time to, to help her understand that this is, you know, uh, um, an environment that we create in the classroom that she can learn as much or even more through the interactions with the teacher and her peers. But she just, you know, had to give the, the teacher time and, 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 and get into, into the, to be receptive and be open to the new environment that she was, that she was in. So yes, it can be very hard for, for, for the students that are used to a very formal teacher that is so powerful in front of the classroom reflecting and that is very cultural, uh, especially this, this lady was from, from Colombia, I think. So yeah, it happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's a good thing to keep in mind to <laughs> try to apply this, yeah. um, that you might get feedback from the students or the parents, like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Why are we playing games? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, or yeah, same thing yeah, in Nicaragua, we get pushback from administrators about that too. Like, 
Why aren't you standing in front of them explaining stuff to them? Why are they having fun, like, and smiling and, and playing around? Yeah, because that's the thing. It's like, that's not, they're making noise. That was the complaint that we were there. They're so loud. But they were loud because they were having fun. And it was loud there. It was always loud. Um, I, I think they were just confused about what's happening. So does the graphic make sense? So the key thing to do task-based learning, and I had considered presenting on this instead, is just creating a good environment. Yeah, so that would be a whole other presentation. How do we create a good learning environment? And then we have to pick good tasks. That's the next step. And then finally, when we set learners to do tasks, do you think we just let them do it and we like ignore them and try to catch up on our grading and stuff? No, right? So I think sometimes that's what we too. Right, because it's like, well, they're doing stuff, they're working, and they're really engaged. If you if you nail it, the students are super engaged, and you could walk away, and they would have a good time, and they'd be they'd be using English, um, but that's not enough. So we we have to monitor, and we have to provide feedback, and then to do that effectively, we have to plan what errors we expect them to make. Yeah, so that's another part of this for the interactional support. We have to be ready to predict what errors they're. So that's the summary of task-based language teaching. I'm not gonna go, to, go into it any more than that. Um, can anyone summarize task-based language teaching before I transition? Yes. Um, not unlike project-based learning, um, assigning relevant, real-life related tasks with achievable, targeted goals that the student understands. And is the focus on meaning or is the focus on form? Um, yeah, it's meaning focus. It's goals. You can communicate what you want to or not. Yeah, and, and then on the, the students produce something measurable yeah. and result. Um, because task based language teaching is meaning focused, does that mean we ignore the construction of grammatical form? Mm -hmm. No. So we'll, we'll go back to that concept shortly. So, this is the, the research paper that came up when I started to look into this more formally. Um, so York and Dehan were, or they are, they're still working on this. Um, they're ESL teachers in Japan, and they wanted to use games, the same way I'm su suggesting, um, to foster spoken communication skills and help students engage with their own learning. So basically, tasks. Um, they want to use board games as tasks. So, they investigated the applicability of the board game, and um, they applied a framework, which is basically a task-based language teaching framework. And um, to collect data, they conducted uh, self-report surveys on the students about their attitudes and their perceptions of the game. So we'll look at that now. But first, so these are the the questions that Jane Lewis gives us to help us identify, is it a task or not? So this is a good little like, guide. So does the activity engage the learner's interest? So what do you think? Would a board game be an engaging thing for most learners? Yeah. Yeah, so the board game design can affect that too. Definitely, right? If the game is really, really wordy, and there's word, print words everywhere, and they're a lower level, that might not look appealing at all. <laughs> yeah. Right? That could just be a shock. Um, but then if they're really advanced and needed on a game like Guess Who, would that be a good pick? A Guess Who for an advanced learner? <coughs> they would be so bored, right? Like, so, um, so yeah, we have to pick good games that will meet their interests. Fortunately, there's so many types of games with different themes and topics. Um, do board games focus on meaning? Or on communicating meaning? Yes. Yeah, that's generally, that's really all they focus on, right? You're trying to achieve a goal together or well, against one another. Is there a, a measurable outcome when we play a board game? Yes. yes. Yeah. You win or you don't, right? <laughs> um, is success judged in terms of outcome? 
that's where it can get a little dicey, right? Because what if it's a competitive game? You don't want a learner who doesn't win in the competitive game to feel like they didn't succeed. So how could we tweak that so that there's an outcome that is measurable that isn't only winning the game? That's what I was wondering. I, I don't believe that winning the game needs to be the only outcome. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening throughout the game, so maybe even if you can't win, the uh, different grammatical terms, vocabulary that's used throughout the game is maybe worth some further examination or to exactly. serve that to the other outcome. Yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly it. Yeah. So you, that's where the teaching teaching experience and training comes in. You have to be creative and you have to think, what can I supplement so that the students can feel like they're achieving something? Yeah. Because most games are competitive, they're win or lose, and if the only outcome is the winning, that, that can kill motivation really quickly. Yeah. Um, so be careful, that's like a warning. Is success judged in terms of outcome? Um, so again, we need to create new outcomes for the game that aren't only winning. We need to create more language-based outcomes. Yeah. So this is kind of where your teaching objectives will start to, you've got to try to align them to the language for the, for the game. And finally, is it related to real-world activities? Uh, what do you think? Are all board games related to real-world activities? Yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> However, playing a board game, is that a real world activity? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> playing games is a real world activity, it's a social activity. And so that would be like one of my arguments in support of it being real world or not. And then I would add some games do provoke or um, cause to, to produce um, language that is real world, like maybe your shopping for games. This might have a pop-up again. It'll come up. So this, these were their findings. Again, these were self-reported. Um, students had to pick their, or give their data on a scale of one to five, with one being strongly disagree, and five being strongly agree. And then these are the averages. So the, game, the games were too difficult. Um, the average score was about a two and a half. So that means it was right in the middle. Yeah, some students thought they were too difficult, some thought they were manageable. Um, it was fun to play the game. And this is, at least for me, really important. Um, in Nicaragua, that, was, that kind of became my default. Like, how do I make this fun? Um, the, the average was four, with a standard deviation of 0.5. So that's pretty clear that they enjoyed the game like the vast majority of students really enjoyed playing the game. Um, the vocabulary in the games was difficult. Again, that's kind of in the middle. But what, is that a good thing or a bad thing? If the vocabulary is kind of difficult. Yeah. Good, yeah. That's, that's perfect. That's the I plus one, right? That's like comprehensible input. It's a little bit beyond that. Zone crossable development, exactly. Just a little bit beyond that. And by working in groups a lot of times, the other because they're in a group, they can figure out the words together, sometimes just working as they play. Um, I, so th they did a whole class based around board games. Most students um, did feel it helped. They learned more English this way than previous methods. Um, they learned, they spoke more, and for me that's another really important one. The interaction increased substantially. Um, they did more homework, although standard deviation, kind of higher. Standard deviation? So the way, you'll see in a second, but the way they structured this, it produced homework, right? So it's not you just do a board game in a classroom, right? There's three stages. There's the pre-stage, the during, and the post-stage. So for the pre-stage and the post-stage, it was a lot of homework. And then, as you'll see as I get a little further, that like the post stage is really where the action happens in terms of you as a teacher. And there's so many different ways you can spin the after game phase. Um, yeah. So this kind of just repeats the, the, the gist. Um, so they spoke and they wrote more um, than normal tasks. 
Um, it increased their agency, so they owned their learning. Um, and this was manifested by the fact that they had to prepare for the game at home. Yeah. And then in the classroom, it was only comprehension checking and maybe one model. So students had to learn how to play the game, which created some social pressure, um, which they described in the article. Um, so they asked some questions like, why did you do your homework? Like, why did you, and it was because they didn't want to ruin the game for the other students. Yeah. So like that was one of the big motivators. They, if they came in and they didn't know how to play the game, it would be awkward for them. Um, so they did more homework and they owned it more. Um, the students did use their L1s to help them, but is that necessarily a bad thing? No. No. Right. So in the past, there was this idea that we should only stick to the target language, but things are shifting now. And a lot of research indicates that the L1 is, I mean, should be obvious, it's a bridge, right? All their ideas exist in their brain in their L1, and we have to help them transfer them. Um, so L1 use is another dicey subject that there's not really time to go into. But in my opinion, it's, it's okay a little um, to help get the meaning. So 94% of students reported they talked about the game in English, which is great. Remember, this is ESL. This isn't ESL. So this is it's a little harder <laughs> to, to get students to produce language. 83.5 um, uh, used the rule book. So that means they were going back and they were reading and they were checking their own comprehension. Um, and finally, 90.4% uh, reporting using English as much as possible. So they were motivated to use English while they played. So that wasn't a requirement then of playing the game? It was. Okay. They were supposed to, but again, that's where it starts to get into like, as a teacher, what should you do? Should you come in and be like, no, English only, English only, English only? Or should you kind of back off and maybe just hover around and not say anything? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the, this task was English only. Definitely, that's how they set the task. You're going to play the game in English. Yeah. So, what do you think? Is it a task? So, were learners interested? Yeah, they owned it, right? They want. They learned the rules on their own, so that their classmates wouldn't be mad at them. And also, I'm sure, for fun, because it's rewarding too, right? So there's a punishment if you don't do it, a social punishment. There's a social reward if you do do it. Um, so, um, in the article, it's clear that they were careful about picking the games, right? So again, that's part of it too. You have to make sure you pick games that are appropriate for their level of interest. Focus on meaning. Yeah. To achieve the goals of the game, it's always going to be a meaning focus. Outcome? What was the asterisk for outcome? Did we just use win or lose as an outcome? No. no. no I would recommend trying to tie in like learning objectives here. Right? So I learned these words by playing the game. Check, 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 or learning this playing this game, I realized my grammar this grammar structure needs improvement. List the grammar structures. Okay? And then that's something that they achieved because noticing is an achievement right when learners become aware of a gap in their knowledge that's I would argue that's an achievement um, okay. okay so this is like the concluding part of the presentation um, almost this is of oh, this one this part so um, so why these board games they're motivated they give they produce comprehensible input um, the game design itself the board with all the pictures on it, and the cards generally have pictures, and it creates a context a lot of times. Um, basically, it does all the things that research indicates support complete acquisition of a second language. And I'll make this available to everyone. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you all, all of the materials. Yeah. I don't mind sharing. Can I ask a question about yeah. language Yes. Um, Noticing, if you look at all the research that they do on noticing, it's super confusing and like 
there's debates as to what notice, what constitutes noticing. Like, do you have to be conscious, or can it be passive? Can you unconsciously notice something and not realize you noticed it, and have that affect your, your language, and have continuous forever? Um, yeah, so with noticing, I, I agree that it would always be good to scaffold helping them notice. Were there any words that you didn't know that you learned? Mm -hmm. But that's noticing, right? There was a word, and I didn't know it. <laughs> so I looked it up. Mm -hmm. That counts as noticing. But then when you get to the more grammatical noticing, or like the more phonological noticing, that becomes, a, in my experience, more subtle. And it's harder to measure and harder, harder to observe. Yeah. yeah, so since we're in this part, I'll really quickly talk about the last board game I used. Has anyone played Pandemic? I'm not going to show you the whole game. Okay. I want you to do more work. I don't want you to just listen to me the whole time. But this is Pandemic. Uh, so the way I started was just by showing them the box and saying, what do you think this game's about? Right. And that produced a whole, a whole bunch of like brainstorming of vocabulary and phrases. Um, this was with uh, inter lower intermediate kids that I did. And then I tried it with uh, advanced or like upper beginner group. And they were able to do it, but it was harder. Um, so in this game, you're trying to prevent the spread of disease. And the language that you use is basically planning language. Right? So I think we should do this, because if we do this, we will have this outcome. Or I disagree. If we do this, this will be the outcome. Yeah, so this was really good for um, uh, conditional. conditional things. <laughs> so it was really, really good practice for conditionals. And you can even tweak it so that it's also like past. If we hadn't done this, they're like past perfect tenses too. Yeah. So you can like have them argue um, a little bit about their past decisions, which you don't need to do. They do it like by themselves, <laughs> right? They'll be like, "Why'd you do that? Now there's disease all over New York, right? There's an outbreak in New York because you thought we should do this." Um, and yeah, and so the games, they, once they learn the game. They were super, super into it, super focused. Uh, and they were doing all these things. They were super motivated. We actually played the game twice because they felt like the first time they were just getting the gist of it. So I let them just do it again. Um, they learned a lot of vocabulary related to board games and related to disease. Um, they produced a lot of language because they were getting mad at each other. Because this, this is a cooperative game. That's another thing I forgot to mention. This is a game where you play together against the game, and you're trying to beat the game. So if you lose, it's like everyone loses together. Did you have the whole class play one game together, or did you have multiple copies of the game? I had multiple copies. Okay. Um, I was lucky, like, us, well, after we played it the first time, when I was just demoing it, a student was like, I want that game. <laughs> I was like, great, you should buy one and bring it to class tomorrow. <laughs> and so when, when we, we were able to do it a second time, it was a small group, I only had eight students in that group. Yeah, so it was like four and four. Yeah. Uh, for, for doing the group, did yeah. you get credit? Okay. It depends on the game. Okay. No, yeah. I'm talking about this one. This one, yeah, two to four players. Oh, okay. Another recommendation when you, when you use games, make sure you obey these, or if you don't, be creative about how you tweak them. Yeah, so in Pandemic, if you do use this game, the way you would tweak it, there's four characters playing on the board at the same time. So like a medic, a helicopter pilot, a doctor, and a construction worker, for example. So there's four people on the board doing things. So you could put students in pairs to be one person. Yeah. Which could be good if it's a <coughs> lower level of students. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. Unfortunately, I didn't film it, and I wasn't able to get any of the students to send me the audio. But what I had them doing while they did this was they recorded their audio. And then they were tasked with going back and finding errors and correcting them. Yeah. So I taught them the form after they played the game. And then they played it one more time. And then they were tasked with noting like five errors and fixing them. Grammatical things? Yeah, grammatical stuff. So you had them focus on that. Yeah, yeah, after. So meeting first, right? playing the game, having fun. And then after the game, I was like, so there was some grammar. Only some of you were meeting but not all of you, this was the grammar. 
And then I wrote it on the board and I just gave like a pretty traditional demonstration of you know grammar. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, try again, play a few more rounds of that. Um, and then on the next class, they were producing the language much more consistently when they played the second time. Yeah, so I, I cut them off. I don't think I was clear about that. I did stop them in the middle of the game and I was like, all right, some of you are using good grammar, some of you are making mistakes. And then I gave them a little lesson. Yeah. And I left all the forms on the board for them to look at. I did blanks so they just insert the language. So I scaffolded it. Um, so my experience has been really good. Um, I've also done it with Guess Who, um, with um, the lower level students, and they loved it too. And the same approach. I showed them the game, let them play it first, stopped them after about 15, 20 minutes, and then I went, are we all using good grammar? Are there any mistakes happening? And then you know, they were all skeptical about their grammar. I was like, yeah, no, we're, we're making some mistakes. This is how you make a question. And then they're like, oh yeah, that's right. Because most of the time, it's somewhere in there. They just can't like recall it and produce it. All right, so as I mentioned before, there's three stages, pre-test, during test, post-test. I'm gonna give you a printout that has all of this on it. Um, so in the pre-play, you're helping the learners understand how to play the game. Um, and you're also checking comprehension. Um, so, so the learners have to study the rules and gameplay as homework, so it's kind of like a flipped classroom approach is what's most recommended because it's really time consuming if you try it otherwise. Um, and learning and discussing the rules of the game is a receptive task in itself. So we do this in class. Okay. So out of class, study how to play the game. In class, comprehension check. Because if you don't, they're probably going to do all sorts of off task like things with the game. So it's, it's not enough to just give them homework. Um, then during play, learners interact to set up and play the game. Um, so setting up the game board itself is a task. Because they have to read the instructions and set the game up. Um, the interactions, as I've been saying, they produce a lot of language. Um, the teacher monitors and provides feedback but more on the gameplay. Are you playing the game within the rules or not? And are you uh, comprehensible? Like are what you're saying, is it, are the words correct? Right? Are you calling the deck a dice, for example? Mm -hmm. Or the pawn a dice? Um, so that kind of feedback, more on meaning. Um, and then you may opt to teach the target forms after learners get the feel for the game, um, especially if time is a limiting factor and you're not gonna be able to do the game on a subsequent class, okay? Um, so the thing with task-based language teaching, which again is debatable if you wanna do this or not as a teacher, task-based language teaching is you have them try to do something, then they lack the language to do it, and then they notice that they do, or you make them aware, and then you teach the language. But I find that, and to me it makes more sense personally, that pre-teaching the language, and then the game, and then reviewing, might be more pedagogically sound, mm -hmm. yeah? But the framework of what task-based language teaching is would tell us not to do that. Because if you pre-teach the grammar, at least from what I understand from, uh, from Jane Willis, it's no longer a task. Because if you teach grammar first, it forms focus. Mm -hmm. Where if you just play the game, it's meaning focus. So again, task-based language teaching, the theory is like a little confusing, and I feel like it does challenge like a lot of intuition teachers have. Um, so again, do your own thing, right? Like trust your own intuition, you know your learners better. This isn't perfect. I guess I, I always wonder if you aren't teaching the grammar right before you start playing it, if it's to complete its transcripts and everything, yeah. and then you would go up and play in the game, and then Exactly, or it could be that. So it, it can take the form of that type of thing, but just something yeah, it's just that are on a grammar book. Yeah, and that, that's a good solution too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a delayed review of grammar. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so it's grammar they've already learned, you bring the board game up to have them recall and reuse the grammar that they've already learned. 
instead of explicitly teaching this work. And then that would solve the conundrum of it not being a path, definitely. Um, for me, what I'm really trying to present is just of how you do this, which we're gonna get to. Um, so you should be providing feedback, moral language, but like I said, with my instinct was don't let them keep committing the errors over and over, because then maybe they're starting to like internalize them, and then they're just gonna keep doing it. So I, it was like let them play for a while and say there's a gap in your knowledge. This is it, let's work on it. And then you play more. Yeah. So this is not what they did. But in their recommendations afterward, they did give a recommendation similar, like your inner Um so. And finally, post play. Like I said, this is where the action happens. And there's so many ways you can spin this. Um, I didn't think it was feasible to try to push everything on here, but I'll give you a link of websites where you see all different ways different teachers are doing the post tasks connected to the game. Um, so if we follow the framework, this, they should receive direct instruction on form. Um, they should re reflect on the language needs that they had. They should um, do some sort of assessment uh, to see if they've actually acquired the target um, language. And it's always good to have them do some more metacognitive reflection too, if you know how to structure that. So basically have them reflect on um, what they gained from doing the, from playing the game. What did they learn? How could they improve in the future? And help them develop, basically help them develop a plan for improving their English and this specific context. Um, and then, like I, this is what I was saying about where the action happens. You can spin um, the post task so many different ways. Um, so you can have them make a tutorial video of how to play the game. Um, they can write like a, a review of the game or film a review where they're playing the game and they're like, this game is awesome or this game is so lame. Um, or you can use them if they're higher, if their higher order thinking skills are strong enough, you can tell them tweak the game. Add a rule, take out a rule. Which reminds me of something I skipped. During play, I really strongly recommend adding a linguistic rule to the game, like language rules. If you don't say the sentence in English, you lose your turn, for example. Right? So try to add rules to the game that will help keep it gamey, <laughs> but that will guide them to producing target language. And that would be during the game. Okay. So if you get into games a lot, you will learn that there are so many different types of games. This is not a complete list. Um, I recommend boardgamegeek.com for more information. Board game geek. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll put a link. There's a link on here. Lots of information about games and what type they are. So I just, again, this is just so you're aware. There's more than just the roll of dice and move a piece kind of games. Um, I suspect, and uh, there's another person online that thinks cooperative games might be the best because they're not competing against each other, so it's not going to create the same sort of competitive animosity that um, that like a game more like checkers or chess might. Yeah, where it's like I beat you, I'm better than you. Right? If it's cooperative, they lose together. So they'll still give each other a hard time, but you don't have that dynamic of one person basically like dominating another person. Um, but when I was making this list, I was thinking all of these could be adapted. Um, you just have to be creative about the language that you're gonna focus on. All right, can you pass out the packets now? Yeah. Now you're gonna start doing work. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna, uh, demonstrate like a, a tool that I made to help you do this. Okay, so you're gonna 
decided to start working in pairs um, from this point forward. Um, but I'm gonna give you a little model. So does everyone know the I do, we do, you do? Like scaffolding thing approach? No? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate it. So I do is you give a model. Okay? So the model is making a lesson with this portion. So the first thing I want you to do is the front of this page, and I gave you the example, guess who? Yeah, can I, does everyone see right here? Yeah. So I want you to think of up to five board games, minimum two, but think of between two and five board games that you're familiar with, that you've played. How could you, uh, we're not there yet, just write the objective of the game. Yeah. So for example, the objective of the game. Of so, the game so guess who? What's the objective of guess who? What do we, has anyone played this game? Well, can you tell me the objective? So you both have um, your, your board and um, you give, uh, the, your opponent asks the question or tries to guess the person. So they, they're describing yeah, exactly. So it's like an information question with physical characteristics. And so both players have one of these traits. That's enough. One of these. They all, they're all different faces with different like, characteristics. And then you... Jobs or just individuals? You, you could use jobs. The way it's designed, it tends to be more physical like, features. So like uh, hair color, skin color, eye color. Facial hair, yeah, glasses. Yeah, gender too. When when they realize that you can use gender, that like obviously they knock down half the faces at one time. Yeah. Um, so this game with adult learners, they get the gist of it quick. But I was surprised to see that it still remains competitive. Like no one no one locked in on like the algorithm underlying the game for you to solve this game because there is a, a series of questions you can ask, but you'll win no matter what, if you go first. <laughs> yeah. Most games are like that. Most games have an underlying algorithm that you can hack the game and you will always win. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so they take turns asking information questions. Does she have long hair or short hair? So the objective of the game is to guess your opponent's character. So you ask a question, and if they say yes, you knock down the opposite features, and if they say no, you might have gotten that backwards, but you flip. And then this process of elimination, and if they comprehend everything correctly, they will guess right. But another thing that happened when I did this, they would guess wrong because they miscomprehended each other. Mm -hmm. So they would be down to one face, and they would say, is it David? And they would be like, no. <laughs> Which was good because then they had to go back and recall all the questions they asked and unflip. So it actually, some interesting things happen doing this. Okay, so what you're gonna do is just pick, because of the time, let's just do two games. Two games you're familiar with and the objective. It can be checkers or chess, so. And then you mean the board game, does that include card games? Yeah, okay. like Uno or even poker. Yeah. Uh, like go fish. Go fish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> any, really any game, okay. except like sports. Are they doing it in groups or? Yeah, so we're compared, <laughs> yeah, or, or <laughs> Or 